Welcome to 60 Rules Puzzles for Magic Judges and Inquisitive Players, which will test your Magic the Gathering rules knowledge. Here's how it works. I'll pose a magic question which requires knowledge of the comprehensive rules to answer. The questions will start off relatively easy and get roughly progressively more complex. You can follow along at home and try to see how many you can guess correctly before I give the answer. Thanks to my judge mentor J.O. for providing many of these questions. So jumping into our first question, let's start off with an easy one. You have a frogmite in hand and control a single black lotus, nothing else. Can you sacrifice black lotus to cast frogmite? Pause the video here if you'd like to guess. Yes you can, but it depends on the timing of when you sacrifice it. The answer lies in the comprehensive rules under section 600, casting spells, specifically subsections 601.2g and h. Abbreviating this section, the cost of a spell is determined before you make payments for it. So in this case, you announce your casting frogmite, affinity means it costs only 3 mana and then the cost becomes locked in, and then you sacrifice black lotus to pay for it. This question is on a corner case that can sometimes come up in Modern's Yawgmoth deck. You control a wall of roots with 4 minus 0 minus 1 counters on it. Can you use its mana ability to pay for an Eldritch Evolution that sacrifices itself? Yes. In a similar vein as the last Frogmite question, the answer lies in the steps to casting a spell as well as how state-based actions work. You see, lethal damage and zero toughness don't actually kill creatures, state-based actions do, and they aren't checked while a spell is resolving, see section 704. So you cast Eldritch Evolution, when payments are required, you activate Wall of Roots putting the last minus zero minus one counter on it, making its toughness zero. Since we're in the middle of casting a spell, Wall of Roots doesn't die yet. Then you finish making payments for Eldritch Evolution by sacrificing Wall of Roots and voila! The next question is similar. Your opponent casts Chain Lightning targeting your Tinder Wall. Can you activate Tinder Wall to pay for a copy of Chain Lightning? Yes, but again, it depends on the timing. If you sacrifice Tinder Wall in response, the Chain Lightning will have no legal target and fizzle. If you allow Chain Lightning to resolve, 3 damage will be marked on Tinder Wall and again, since the spell is still resolving, it won't die yet. You can then sacrifice Tinder Wall to pay for the copy. Your opponent controls a Mayhem Devil. Alas, the only thing you have is a Screlvin Hand. Oh well, guess you may as well cast it. Oh no, somehow you forgot you already have a Screlv on the board. Now you'll lose both of them, one to the Legend Rule and then the other to Devil. Or will you? In fact, you'll only lose one to the Legend Rule. You see, the Legend Rule doesn't actually cause you to sacrifice anything. It's its own unique state-based action. See section 704.5J. Your opponent controls a 4-5 Tarmogoyf. You cast Duplicant and exile it. What are Duplicant's power and toughness? What if cards enter or leave the graveyards later that change how many types there are? Well, not only are Duplicant's power and toughness equal to Tarmogoyf's, since they're variable, they'll continue to update for the rest of the game. Your opponent controls Ghostly Prison, and you want to attack them. Somehow, your only source of mana is Lion's Eye Diamond. Can you activate LED to pay for Ghostly Prison? Why or why not? You can't. LED specifies that, unlike other mana abilities, it can only be activated as an instant. Paying the cost of Ghostly Prison occurs during the declaration of attackers and is thus not a window in which you can activate it. And if you try to get clever by activating it at the beginning of combat, the mana will empty when you move to attacks. You have two Pepper Smokes which draw a card if you control a fairy. Alas, you don't control a fairy. Can you cast one of them, hold priority, and cast the second one while the first is still on the stack to draw a card since Pepper Smoke is a tribal fairy? No. The if you control a fairy part of the ability specifically refers to a fairy permanent. If it said fairy spell, then it would work. You cast Oblivion Sower, exiling the top four cards of the opponent's library. Separate from this, you're playing against Lantern, and there are multiple face-down cards in exile from Pixis of Pandemonium. Since Oblivion Sower's ability extends to all exiled cards, not just the ones it itself exiled, can you look at them to see if they're lands? What if you know the identities of the cards because Lantern of Insight was in play when they were exiled?
No. Not only can you not look at them, you can't pick them even if you know what they are because face down cards have no characteristics. See section 708. You cast Discovery. For the purposes of this question, we don't care about the dispersal half of the card. While surveilling, one of the cards is Nexus of Fate. What happens if you surveil Nexus into your graveyard and leave the second card on top? The two actions happen simultaneously. One is Nexus of Fate's replacement effect to be shuffled in, the other is choosing to put the second card on top. So you shuffle in Nexus and put the second card on top and then draw that card. Your opponent casts a spell via flashback, in this case let's say Faithless Looting. If you cast Delay targeting it, what happens? Part of the flashback ability is that the spell is exiled instead of going back to the graveyard. It doesn't care how or why it goes to exile. Therefore, since delay causes the spell to be exiled, there's no conflict between delay and the flashback effect, so it'll be exiled with suspend. When it eventually comes off suspend, it's cast as a fresh faithless looting and goes to the graveyard as normal. Similar to the last question, you activate Narset Transcendence minus two ability and then cast Temporal Trespass. What happens? As a refresher, here's the text for Rebound. It'll just be exiled. This is because of how Rebound is worded. It creates a replacement effect that applies if the card would be put into the graveyard. Since Trespass exiles itself, the replacement effect doesn't apply. Your opponent controls Dothy Voidwalker and Leyline of the Void. When one of your cards goes to exile, can you choose to not put a Void counter on it? Yes. When two or more replacement effects are competing, the affected player, owner, or controller chooses how they apply. In this case, you control the affected card and can choose to apply Dothy or Leyline first. See Rule 616.1. You control Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, and your opponent casts Dress Down. Do they get to draw a card? Unfortunately, they do. When Dress Down hits the field, the game asks, should this ability trigger? And because Elishnor now has no abilities, it will. You're playing Legacy Infect and you're facing Burn. If you have Invigorate and your opponent controls Sulfuric Vortex, can you still cast it using its alternate life gain cost? Yes. In this case, gaining life is the cost to cast Invigorate, and while Sulfuric Vortex replaces that effect with gaining zero life instead, you can still pay it. This is notably different from cards that prevent the life gain, such as Roiling Vortex's activated ability, which would prevent you from casting it. You have a Fireball in hand, 3 mana, and would like to kill your opponent's Dryad Arbor and Phantasmal Bear. Can you target and kill both of them? No. Even though you can target both, since you can only make x equal 1 and there are two creatures, the damage can't be evenly divided, so Fireball will deal 0, meaning you can kill either Dryad or Bear, but not both. Your opponent controls Dragonlord Colagon. If you have a Murktide Regent in your graveyard and you cast another Murktide Regent, delving away the one in your graveyard, do you still lose 10 life? No. By the time Colagon would trigger, the Murktide in the graveyard is already exiled. You control Sky Shroud Elf, Ashnod's Altar, and no other mana sources or creatures. With just these two cards, how many times can you filter mana that isn't red or white into red or white? Twice. You can activate Sky Shroud's first ability to add green, then filter it into red or white with the second ability. Then, you can activate the second ability once and use Sacrificing Sky Shroud to Ashnod's Altar to pay for it. You can't do it twice because mana abilities have to resolve before you can activate them again. And by then, Sky Shroud has been sacrificed. See Rule 605.3c. Your opponent controls Birds of Paradise, Deathrite Shaman, and Chandra Torch of Defiance. You have a Pithing Needle, but it specifically excludes mana abilities. Which, if any, of their mana-adding abilities can you shut off with Needle? Deathrites and Chandras. 
An activated ability is a mana ability as long as it adds mana, doesn't target, and isn't a Planeswalker loyalty ability. See section 605. You have a Restoration Angel in hand. The only creature you control is a Phantasmal Bear. Since you obviously don't want to sacrifice it, what happens if you cast Restoration Angel? Phantasmal Bear dies. While choosing whether to blink a creature with Restoration Angel is optional, targeting it isn't. Therefore, you'll be forced to target Phantasmal Bear and sacrifice it, regardless of whether you actually would have chosen to blink it or not. You cast Replenish, and the only enchantments in your graveyard are Eidolon of Blossoms and Call to Serve. How many cards do you draw? One. You obviously draw from Eidolon entering the battlefield, but in the case of Auras, they can only re-enter the battlefield if you already control a legal object to attach them to. Since Call and Eidolon would be entering simultaneously, Eidolon isn't a valid choice. This is similar to how if you collected company into two creatures and one of them is a clone, you can't copy the other one. You control Void Stalker. You activate it, targeting your opponent's creature. In response, they cast a bounce spell on Void Stalker. What happens? The opposing creature is still a legal target and therefore is put on top, and both players shuffle the libraries, but Void Stalker stays in your hand. You control Spellskite and two Grizzly Bears. Your opponent casts Fury and targets both bears for two damage each. You really want to keep both bears since bears are cool. Can you redirect both targets to Spellskite? No, you can only keep one bear. If a spell has multiple targets but only uses the word target once, Spellskite can only redirect one of them. You control Jin Illuminatus as your only non-land permanent and want to copy Momentous Fall. What happens? You can copy it as many times as you can pay for Replicate, and each copy will draw three cards and gain five life. Jin Illuminatus gives instants and sorceries replicate the moment you begin casting them, which you can choose to pay for before Jin is sacrificed. The copies retain the values of the sacrificed creature when determining drawing cards and gaining life. See section 707. Speaking of momentous fall, what if you control Omnath Locus of Mana and have exactly four green mana in your pool before you cast fall? How many cards do you draw? One or five. Pursuant to rule 601.2h, you can pay the costs of a spell in any order, so you can choose to sacrifice Omnath first or spend the mana first. You cast a spell with Cascade, let's say Shardless Agent, and the spell you cascade into is Devastating Summons. You'd like to float mana and then sack your lands, can you? No. The ability to activate mana abilities during the casting of a spell only applies to spells that require a mana payment. Since you cascaded into Devastating Summons, it doesn't require a mana payment, so you can't actually float mana before casting it. You control Mastery of the Unseen and activate it, manifesting a Delver of Secrets. What happens if you turn it face up? It turns face up, but on its front side. Golgari Grave Troll is the only creature in your graveyard. If you cast Dread Return on it by sacrificing three creatures, how big will Grave Troll be? Four, four. As Grave Troll returns to the battlefield, it checks how many creatures are in your graveyard, and since it hasn't technically changed zones yet and is thus still in your graveyard, it counts itself as it enters. You control Experiment Kraj and Gideon Jura. You turn Gideon into a creature using his zero ability and put a plus one counter on him with Kraj. Which of Gideon's abilities can Kraj activate? And also, if you can activate the plus two, what happens if you activate it? You can activate the plus two and zero abilities, but not the minus two ability since Kraj doesn't have any loyalty counters to remove. Nothing happens if you activate the plus two since creatures can't attack other creatures. You attack with a Glistener Elf that's been pumped up to 5 power. 
Your opponent blocks with a young wolf that has a plus one counter on it. After damage is dealt, will the wolf undying back onto the battlefield or stay dead? The wolf will stay dead. There are two state-based actions being checked. One is the plus one counter and minus one counter canceling each other out. The other is Young Wolf having zero or less toughness and thus being put into the graveyard. Both state-based actions are applied simultaneously, so when the Young Wolf is in the graveyard and Undying sees whether it should trigger or not, it looks back to the last known state of Young Wolf on the battlefield and sees that it had both a plus one counter and minus one counter on it, and thus Undying does not trigger. You control Cauldra Complete attached to a germ token. What happens if the germ token is targeted by Reality Ripple? Also, what if Cauldra Complete is the target? If the germ token is the target, Cauldra Complete phases out with it and phases back in still attached to it. If Cauldra is the target, the germ is left behind and dies due to having zero toughness. Cauldra phases back in next turn not attached to anything and doesn't trigger since it's not re-entering the battlefield, it's just unfazing. See section 702.26. You control Teferi's Veil. You unearth Fate Stitcher and attack with it. What happens to Fate Stitcher? Fate Stitcher phases out at end of combat. When the delayed trigger of Unearth tries to exile it at end of turn, nothing happens since it's phased out. When it phases back in, the continuous effect of Unearth that would exile it if it would leave the battlefield continues to apply for the rest of the game. You control Crufix, God of Horizons. You tap Cavern of Souls for colored mana, but don't spend it. What happens to the mana? The mana becomes colorless, but retains its tribal restriction and uncounterability clause. You control a 3-3 with first strike, let's say Goblin Chain Whirler. You equip it with Inquisitor's Flail and attack. Your opponent double blocks it with two 3-3s. What happens? Chain Whirler and one of the 3-3s die. You must assign lethal damage to a blocker before you can assign any damage to the next one, so you assign 3 damage to the first 3-3 and Flail doubles that to 6. First strike damage happens and then we move to regular combat damage, whereupon the second 3-3 deals lethal to Chain Whirler. You cast Emrakul the Promised End and gain control of your opponent. They have a card that retrieves other cards from their sideboard, such as Karn the Great Creator. What happens if you use it? You can't look at or otherwise access your opponent's sideboard even if you control them. See Tournament Rules Section 3.16. Lantern of Insight is on the battlefield and a player casts Brainstorm. Which cards are seen by their opponent? Cards are drawn one at a time, meaning the three cards drawn by Brainstorm are seen. The top card immediately after drawing but before putting two cards back, i.e. the fourth card down, is also revealed. Lastly, two cards are put back simultaneously and only the new top card is revealed. We all know what happens to Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth when Blood Moon is in play, but what about Blood Sun? Urborg loses its ability, but lands are still swamps anyway. Oh look, this many questions in and we're finally getting to layers. Layers determine the order of how certain abilities apply, from top to bottom, say it with me, CCTTCAP, or copy, control, text, type, color, abilities, and power and toughness, which is further subdivided into characteristic defining, think Tarmogoyf, setting power and toughness, Mutavault, Gideon, modification, plus one counters, lord effects, and lastly, switching, twisted image. In this case, Urborg's ability applies first in layer 4, type changing effects, whereas Blood Sun applies later, two layers below that, in ability removing effects. Yes, it's unintuitive. You have a Vesuva in hand, but the only other land on the battlefield is an Urborg you control. You don't want to miss your land drop, and you don't want to bin one of them to the legend rule. Can you still play Vesuva without this happening? Yes. You can choose to have Vesuva enter without copying anything. It'll enter as a blank land, and Urborg will make it a swamp. It's your second main phase. You control Yixlid Jailer and have a Berserk in your graveyard. 
What happens if you try to cast Snapcaster Mage, target Berserk, and flash it back? Since Yixla Jailer and Snapcaster both create effects in the ability layer, timestamps apply. Since Snapcaster entered after Yixla Jailer, Berserk gains flashback. Additionally, it doesn't have any of its other abilities, including the cast only before the combat damage step restriction, meaning you can flash it back whenever you want. This one takes some setup. You have a Murktide in hand and a Milliken in play. Between your available mana and the cards in your graveyard, including the mana and milled card that Milliken will add when you activate it, you'll have exactly enough to cast Murktide, no more and no less. Since Milliken's ability is a mana ability, you can activate it during the casting of Murktide. You don't have to activate it beforehand. So you announce that you're casting Murktide and, during the activation of mana abilities, you activate Milliken. But, the card you mill over is Nexus of Fate. What happens? Nexus of Fate shuffles back into your library, and now you're one card short of being able to pay for Murktide. Since Murktide is now illegally cast, you have to rewind, but you can't rewind milling and shuffling your deck, so the Milliken activation and Nexus shuffle are preserved. You control Worms of the Earth and Dryad Arbor. You cast a clone and choose Dryad Arbor as the creature to copy. What happens? The clone goes directly to the graveyard. This example is actually given right in the comprehensive rules under 608.3e. If a permanent spell resolves but its controller can't put it onto the battlefield, that player puts it into their graveyard instead. Mirror Weave is a spell that turns all creatures into copies of another creature. Let's say there's an animated Mutavault, a crude smuggler's copter, and a face down morph creature. If you target one of them with Mirror Weave, what do the other creatures look like? Describe each scenario. If you target Mutavault, all other creatures are Mutavault lands that are not animated and don't have every creature type. If you target Smuggler's Copter, all other creatures are Copter vehicles that aren't crude. If you target the Morph creature, all other creatures become 2-2s with no name, creature type, or any other characteristic. You have an Emblazoned Golem in hand, a Mycosynth Golem on the battlefield, and infinite mana of all colors. Let's say you control 10 artifacts total, including Mycosynth Golem. How big can you make Emblazoned Golem? Sixteen seventeen. Although Emblazoned Golem restricts how much mana you can pay into its kicker to 5, one of each color, Mycosynth Golem grants it Affinity, and Affinity doesn't care which part of the cost it reduces. Therefore, you can cover the initial 2 for Emblazoned Golem's casting cost with mana, then choose X equals up to 5, plus however many artifacts you have, in this case 10, so 15 total. So you pay Wooburg, and reduce X by 10 via Affinity. Golem starts as a 1-2, and you add 15 plus 1 counters. You cast Burning Inquiry, and there are multiple creatures with Dredge in both graveyards. What order do the draws slash dredges happen in? The draws occur according to APNAP, or Active Player, Non-Active Player Order. Since it's your turn, you're the active player. You'll draw slash dredge all three cards first, then the opponent draws slash dredges, and then both of you discard your three random cards simultaneously. It's round one of a modern tournament and you're on the draw. On turn one, your opponent evokes grief and casts Not Dead After All on it. How quickly do you scoop? Your opponent controls Malira, Silvok Outcast. You animate an Ink Moth Nexus and attack with it. Your opponent blocks it with a 2-2. Before damage, you activate Vault of the Archangel. What happens? Ink Moth dies and you gain one life. Malira makes creatures lose Infect, but Ink Moth's ability gives it Infect, so due to timestamps, it still has Infect. However, Malira also prevents it from putting minus one counters on creatures, and creatures with Infect deal damage in the form of minus one counters. When Ink Moth attempts to damage the 2-2 blocking it, it assigns two damage, but no minus one counters are actually placed. That is, no damage is marked. However, it did assign damage, so the lifelink from Vault applies. You've gained control of an opponent's Lich's Mirror. You receive your 10th Poison Counter. What happens? The game is a draw. 
Lich's mirror shuffles all permanents you own into your library. Since you've gained control of it but don't own it, it stays on the battlefield. So after its ability resolves, you'll still control it and you'll still have 10 poison counters, causing its ability to occur again and again over and over in an infinite loop, thus drawing the game. You control Sylvan Library and have creatures with Dredge in your graveyard. During your draw step, you use Sylvan Library's ability and opt to replace all your draws with Dredge's instead. How many cards do you have to put back? Zero. You only have to put back cards you've actually drawn. Since you've dredged everything, the put cards back part of Library's ability doesn't apply. However, if you draw even once, including your normal draw for the turn, and then dredge, then you'll have to put cards back. You control Sylvan Library. In your upkeep, you cast Brainstorm. Then you draw two extra cards with Library. Which cards can you choose to put back? You can only choose the cards you've kept separate from the rest of your hand. If you mixed the Brainstorm draws into your hand, you can't choose them. You control the Scarab God and Muragonda Petroglyphs. You activate its ability to eternalize a Tarmogoyf. How big is it? Six, six. The Scarab God overwrites Tarmogoyf's stat line and the ability that defines it, meaning Tarmogoyf returns as a 4-4 with no abilities and then gets pumped by Petroglyphs. You control Jade Statue and Nurok Transmuter. You activate Jade Statue, turning it into a creature. You then target it with Nurok Transmuter's second ability. What are Jade Statue's types after combat? Jade Statue is a blue permanent with no types, at least until end of turn. At end of combat, Jade Statue's ability wears off, removing creature from its types. However, Transmuter's ability removing artifact from its types is still active until the end of turn, so it is a typeless permanent. You control a forest, a sapperling token, and life on limb. You cast Conspiracy and name a creature type other than sapperling. What are their creature types? The sapperling is whatever type you named and not a forest, and the forest is a forest sapperling. Now we come to the wonderful world of dependencies. Dependencies occur when two effects apply in the same layer, but applying one changes the effect of the other one, in which case you chuck timestamps in the garbage. It's very complicated, so see rule 613.8 if you want to know more. However, in this case, both life and limb and conspiracy are dependent on each other, so we revert to timestamps. You control a creature and a token copy of Simeon's Spirit Guide. Your opponent casts Withdraw, bouncing Spirit Guide, then they target your other creature. Can you exile Spirit Guide from your hand to pay the one? No. Remember that state-based actions aren't checked during the resolution of a spell and tokens ceasing to exist is a state-based action, see rule 704.5d. So for the duration of Withdraw resolving, you technically have a token copy of Spirit Guide in your hand. However, Rule 111.8 states that tokens can't change zones multiple times a turn. You control Sigarda, Host of Herons. Let's say you have 5 life. If your opponent casts Killing Wave for x equals 6, do you lose the game? No. Since Killing Wave is a choice, you can opt not to pay the life, and then Sigarda prevents herself from being sacrificed. You control Future Sight and Graft Digger's Cage, and the top card of your library is Zoetic Cavern. Can you cast it as a morph creature from the top of your library? Why or why not? You can't. The first ability of Graft Digger's Cage actually doesn't affect Zoetic Cavern since it's a land. However, the second ability prevents you from casting spells from your library, which does stop it. You control a face down Zoetic Cavern. There's a Blood Moon or a Humility on the battlefield. What happens when you turn Zoetic Cavern face up? You can't turn it face up if you have Blood Moon in play, but you can if Humility is in play. When you attempt to turn any face down morph creature face up, the game checks what the morph cost would be if it were face up. Since Zoetic Cavern wouldn't have any abilities under Blood Moon, you can't, see rule 702.37e, but since Humility doesn't affect Zoetic Cavern since it's a land, you can turn it face up in that case. 
Humility is on the battlefield. You cast Possessed Avon and there are seven cards in the graveyard. Describe Possessed Avon's characteristics such as color, abilities, and power and toughness. Possessed Avon is a black 2-2 and has the activated tap ability granted by Threshold. The key here is that the color changing effect from Threshold applies in layer 5 before Humility removes the ability in layer 6. Since the effects from Threshold are all on one ability and it applies in different layers, altering color, abilities, and power and toughness, it continues to apply even though Humility removes the ability. See Rule 613.6. .6. There's a Season of the Witch on the battlefield. If a player controls Master of Cruelties and two other creatures, depending on which ones attack, which of them die at end of turn? If you attack with Master of Cruelties, the other two won't die, and vice versa. Season of the Witch exempts creatures that couldn't attack, even if you had a way to let them attack. You control Volrath's Shapeshifter. The top card of your graveyard is Hack on Stromgald Scourge. The second card down is Grid Monitor. What happens if you try to cast Hack on from your graveyard? You can't cast it. The moment you try and cast Hack on, it moves to the stack, and Grid Monitor becomes the new top card in your graveyard. Volrath's Shapeshifter gains the Can't Cast Creatures ability, and the game checks whether casting Hack on is a legal play, which it no longer is. You cast Word of Command. This one's pretty complicated, so take a moment. You choose a card that causes your opponent to search their library. While searching, you notice they have a Planglacial Worm in there. Since you control them while the spell is resolving, can you force them to cast Worm? Yep. Okay, buckle up, this last one's complicated. It's a three-player game of Commander. Player A controls Simic Guildmage. Player B casts Confiscate on Guildmage, gaining control of it. Player C casts a second Confiscate on the first Confiscate, gaining control of both all Confiscates and Guildmage. Player C activates Guildmage's second ability and attaches Confiscate number one to Confiscate number two. What is the end result? Simic Guildmage is no longer enchanted by either Confiscate and returns to player 1's control. Both Confiscates are enchanting each other and, due to timestamps, are now both controlled by player B. Well, that's a wrap. Although I tried to thoroughly vet the answers, if I got one of them wrong, please let me know in the comments so I can correct it. That concludes the video and I hope you've enjoyed it. How many did you guess correctly? Thank you to my supporters, and if you enjoy these videos, consider subscribing, liking the video, or supporting the channel on Patreon. And take care.